Hello. I'm going to be reading a few pages from a book. It's Del William Butler Yeats and Occultism by H.R. Botchen. I'll begin on page 114. The writings of Swedenborg can be roughly placed in four groups, purely scientific, pseudo-philosophic, traditionally dogmatic, and wholly visionary. The first of these hardly concerns us here, but before we discuss the rest, it is necessary that we should familiarize ourselves with two of the doctrines that are particularly associated with his name and that are fundamental to any understanding of his thought. The one is that of correspondences and the other that of the degrees. By the doctrine of correspondence, Swedenborg meant that everything that we perceive in our visible or material world has something corresponding to it in the visible or the spiritual world. He believed, for example, that our physical body has a corresponding spiritual body from which it derives its energy and vitality. He declares, and this is a quote, the whole natural world corresponds to the spiritual world, not only collectively, but in every part, and therefore whatever exists in the natural world from the spiritual is said to be the correspondent of that from which it exists. Since man is a heaven and also a world in least form after the image of the greatest, therefore in him there is a spiritual world and a natural world. The interiors, which are of his mind and have reference to understanding and will, constitute his spiritual world. But the exteriors, which are of his body and have reference to his senses and actions, constitute his natural world. Swedenborg's doctrine of degrees can be said to be the supplementary to his doctrine of correspondence. Its aim is twofold. Firstly, to draw a distinction between visible and invisible world, and secondly, to emphasize the relationship existing between the different kingdoms of nature, namely, the mineral, the vegetable, and the animal. Degrees are of two kinds, the continuous and the discrete, that is, those that are not continuous. For instance, light and darkness, for light can gradually fade into darkness, belong to continuous degrees. Things related by discrete degrees, on the other hand, do not indicate the, the difference of degree, but that of kind. They can be prior and posterior, they can be cause and effect, but they can, at no stage, change into one another. Thus, the three kingdoms of nature, the mineral, the vegetable, and the animal, are related to each other by continuous degrees. Whereas the natural, the spiritual, and the celestial worlds are separated from each other by discrete degrees. The natural needs the inflow of the Lord to become spiritual, and the spiritual a further inflow from Him, capital Him, to be celestial. The natural can never become, simply by its own mechanical evolution, spiritual or celestial, as the mineral can become the vegetable or the vegetable the animal. One aim of all Swedenborg's philosophical thinking was to analyze and generalize the relationship between continuous degrees and to bridge the gulf between the discrete ones. Swedenborg attempted to realize the first part of his aim in his pseudo-philosophical work, Principia, or the First Principles of Natural Things, being attempts towards a philosophical ex explanation of the elementary world, 1734. In this book, he elaborated the theory of the deduction of matter from, quote, points of pure motion produced immediately from the infinite, unquote. Since Yeats refers to this work in a vision, and since it provides one source of his theory of the gyres, that's G-Y-R-E-S, it is worthwhile to understand Swedenborg's proof of his point. The clearest account has been given by Chris Old in his preface to the English translation of the book. Wilkinson has summarized it thus, and I quote, The object of the Principia is to trace out a true system of the world, and in so doing the author has distributed his subject into three parts. The first part treats of the origin and laws of motion, and is mostly devoted to the consideration of its first principles, which are investigated philosophically, then geometrically, their existence being traced from a first natural point down to the formation of a solar vortex, and afterwards from the solar vortex to the successive constitution of the elements and of the three kingdoms of nature. From the first element to the last compound, it is the author's object to show
that effort or canatus to motion tends to a spiral figure and that there is an actual motion of particles constituting a solar chaos which is spiral and consequently vortical, a vortex. In the second part, the author applies this theory of vortical motion to the phenomena of magnetism by which on the one hand he endeavored to test the truth of his principles and on the other by application of the principles to explain the phenomena of magnetism. The motion of the magnetical effluva being as in the former case considered to be vortical. Quote again. In the third part, the author applies the same principle of motion to cosmogony, including the origination of the planetary bodies from the sun and their vortical revolutions until they arrived at their present orbit. Likewise, to the constitution and laws of the different elements, the motions of all which are alleged to be vortical. Likewise, to the constitution and laws of the three kingdoms of nature, the animal, vegetable, and mineral, so that the entire Principia aims to establish a true story of vortices, founded upon a true system of corpuscular philosophy. Thus we see that on the fundamental principle of vortical motion, Swedenborg explained the universe from the infinite to the animal kingdom. But the mysterious gap between the animal and the human was staring him in the face. He argued, since the soul is created, it is finite and mechanical, though there is a mechanical which cannot perish. That's a quote. This he called the, the higher finites, far above the lower finites, to which belonged the souls of brutes. In his conception, the human soul was diffused throughout the body and its vehicle was blood. The soul itself was a purer and finer blood, the spiritus fluid, though he accepted it could not live without the inflow from the deity. It was this immortal spiritus substratum of the physical body which continued to live and act after death. Paracelsus, two centuries earlier, had called it the sidereal, or astral body. Swedenborg had gone to the last limits of the continuous degrees. Beyond those limits, science, logic, and argument were of no avail. There was no link between the continuous and the discrete degrees. Only two courses were now open to him, that of the scriptures and that of his own visions. His Arcana Celestia is an exposition of the spiritual sense of the books of Genesis and Exodus. The results of his visions are given mainly in his spiritual diary and heaven and hell. All that is written there is what he has seen with his own eyes and heard with his own ears. He says in one of his autobiographical letters, quote, I have been called to a holy office by the Lord himself who most mercifully appeared before me, his servant in the year 1743, when he opened my sight into the spiritual world and enabled me to converse with spirits and angels in which state I have continued up to the present day. From that time I began to print and publish the various arcana that were seen by me or revealed to me concerning heaven and hell, the state of man after death, the true worship of God, the spiritual sense of the word, besides other most important matters conducive to salvation and wisdom. Swedenborg's spiritual world corresponds to the natural world as we know it. Corresponds is a vague word. It is an exact copy of the world in which we live and move and have our being. When a man is dead, he opens his eyes in a world which is so similar to his own that he hardly believes he is dead. He thinks he has just got up from a deep sleep. Swedenborg interviewed certain souls that had lately departed from this world. Quote, they requested me to say that they were not dead, but living, that they were as truly men as before, that they had only migrated from one world into another, that they were not aware they had lost anything because they were in a body, possessing every sense the same as before. The first state of life after death is such as had been in the world, but it successively changed either into heaven or hell. They were much surprised that they should have lived in such ignorance and blindness concerning the state of their life after death. The souls, according to Swedenborg, had not to wait for the day of judgment. Their judgment began soon after their arrival in the spiritual world. In a way, it was inherent in their very nature. In the first state after death, the souls exhausted the, the desires that were not true to their real selves, the good, any of their weaknesses toward badness, the bad, any of their pretensions towards goodness, and then they gravitated to heaven or to hell, and there too to a state which they deserved or to which they were inclined. God never elevated souls into heaven or threw them down into hell. All souls lived in the heaven or hell which they themselves created. <laughs>
In Swedenborg's hell there were no eternal flames or fire. The evil souls burned in their own lust. For them it was suffering enough that they were not allowed to have any fulfillment of their evil desires. They could multiply their desires and suffering and sink lower and lower into hell, but they could never per per perish. Their soul, their torture was endless. Similarly, the good souls went to heaven and were made more and more perfect, though they could never achieve absolute perfection. Many of them were exalted into angels. In fact, all angels were once human beings. Heaven was nothing but the mundane world idealized, and everybody there found his own occupation to follow. The angels drank, ate, worked, sang, played, danced, lived in houses, moved in society, married, and had sexual intercourse. The union of the angels was the conflagration of the whole body, though no children were born. They were free from the bonds of time. Actually, as they grew older, they grew younger and younger. Besides the two kinds of spirits that went to heaven and hell, the, the angelic and satanic, satanic, there were spirits that were called the natural and the corporeal, which formerly descended among men and possessed them, though the Lord long ago had cast them into hell. Swedenborg, of course, believed in the possibility of men seeing and conversing with spirits, though he gave a warning against the danger of doing so unless one was grounded in true faith. In fact, man himself was a spirit, with this difference that in his body on this earth he was encompassed, encompassed with a physical body. Thus, the spiritual world, including heaven and hell, was no mystery. It could as well be imagined as could the real world be known. Similarly, the, ple the pleasure and pain of heaven and hell could be described in terms of earthly pleasure and pain. In short, the other world was our own world with but another name. This is a very brief account of Swedenborg's visionary or supernatural world. I have said nothing about his dogmatic interpretation of theological writings and purposely. Yeats, I am positive, never took any interest in them. He even ridiculed Swedenborg for being under the literal inspiration of the Bible. That bird makes me laugh. <laughs> Blake called him the Samson shorn by the churches. In fact, the only book of, books of Swedenborg mentioned in Yeats' writing were the Principia, Heaven and Hell, and the Spiritual Diary. In his personal library at Dublin, besides these works, there were, there were 1891 editions of Heavenly Arcana and Conjugal Love, and a 1909 edition of a Compendium of the Theological Writings of Swedenborg, and possibly he read them in part or in full. But I am of the opinion that whatever Yeats took from Swedenborg came chiefly from heaven and hell and the spiritual diary. For his gyres, he owed a nominal debt, if any, to Principia. A gyre, for those who don't know, is 2,000 years. It's a span of 2,000 years. Uh, Yeats began his poem, The Second Coming, with that. Turning and turning in the ever-widening gyres, the falcon no longer hears the falconer. It's one of the most marvelous poems that ever was written, I believe. Anyway, that is... My, my story for the time being.